Oh, okay, cool. Now we can all hear me more better. Great. Great, great, great. So we're kind of on hold indefinitely waiting for Angola to tell us that we're allowed to start applying for stuff. So we'll be here for for a little while. Um, I just want to thank you guys again. I've been here. I think this is our third or fourth time. We love coming back here and thank fourth time and thank Joe especially. Sometimes it's hard when you've known somebody since they were this big to let them come and preach to your church on a Sunday. But he's always always asked us to come back and it's and it's always been really great. Um, I just want to start with a story. So when Lauren and I, we joined Overland separately, we did missions separately for about a year and a half, and then the first year after we got married, uh, we went back to Zambia as a couple, and Lauren was still leading short-term expedition trips. So you just take a bunch of people, generally from America, until we've branched out more. They come for about two weeks, hop in a big truck, go out into the middle of the bush and we just go house to house and just preach the gospel and share the gospel with people for two weeks. Um, so the first trip that I co-led with, we went to uh, a chiefdom called Maponza. So we load the truck, go out there. When we arrive, there's there's two men there that are there just to, to greet us. The one guy, his name is Joe. Um, and Joe is kind of like a police officer, security guy, kind of guy who's just there to to help us arrive and make sure we set up okay and he was going to go out with the with the teams and watch the camp for us so that nothing happens to the truck just to kind of greet us and make sure we we get settled okay so we arrive we unload the truck we unpack all of our stuff and we're pretty exhausted it's like a five-ish hour drive I think in a big bumpy truck and then once you set up all your stuff so we just throw out chairs and collapse in the shade and then start talking to Joe and he has all these he has a lot of questions it's like our first day there and he's just firing off all of these very hypothetical but oddly specific questions at us um you know about about baptism if you're baptized but then maybe you like go away from the church and you do some drinking like do I have to get baptized again and like, what if I'm struggling, you know, my wife and I aren't doing some... This is just someone. We don't know who he's talking about, but these are just very hypothetical questions. Um, so we eventually just ask, like, well, what do you... Like, what about you? Like, do you have... Do you have any kind of relationship with, with Jesus Christ? And that's when, that's when we found out. He said, oh, this... I have to tell you, it's me that I've been asking all these questions about, which we kind of knew by the nature of the questions. Um, and we just shared, we just shared with him and, and walked him through, you know, what does a relationship with Christ look like? Cause he was well churched. He knew all of the rules and the procedures and knowing that he didn't measure up. So he just kind of fell away from what the church was because there was no depth to the relationship he had. It was just, this is what they say I have to do. I have to stop doing this, this, and this and come to church these days. And I can't do those things. So I probably just have to keep getting baptized and keep, you know, praying for forgiveness and keep doing these things over and over again and never really, really measure up. Measure up. Um, and once we, we sat and talked with him for a while and, and just opened his eyes to, you know, the God who's, who's come to you, who's living and wants a relationship, isn't just looking for procedures and laws and rules, you could see the, the tangible change, his face filled with joy and his life changed from then. He actually came around every day the team went out to do ministry. He jumped in with a team somewhere and went to a house and, and sat as they preached. Um, and it was really, it was amazing to see. Um, it's been maybe two years since that. I, I checked in with the team recently. He's still, he's still the guy. He still sets up Farming God's Way conferences. He started doing kids ministry um, with people around his house and he's He's, he's, doing, he's doing all the things. He just needed to hear that, no, it's a relationship. It's not just rules and laws, but there's a God who actually has come to you, is talking to you, and wants, and wants to have a relationship and a depth of relationship with you. And that causes all the change. Because if, no, if there's no heart change, then the life as a Christian isn't sustainable. If you're not doing it in relationship with someone, then it can't be sustained for any length of time. Um, so that's what I want to look at today. Um, if you have Bibles, please open them 
uh, to Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to read a really big chunk of scripture, not because I talk fast and want to waste a bunch of time, but because it's more than just, there's something that personally that I feel when I read this letter that Paul is reading to the Philippians. There's a language that he uses that's always very striking and very challenging to me because of how just extreme it is. Um, so I'm going to start in verse 12, and I'm going to read all the way to verse 30. So buckle up and, and read along if you have your Bibles with you. Philippians chapter 12, it reads, I want, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become, become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Indeed, there's some who preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Sure. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This passage was also always really weird for me when I was growing up, because it seems weird that Paul is saying, you know, I would rather die and go be with Christ, because that's a lot better than this, but... Maybe I'll stick around. Because for me, living in America, I've always thought, it's not all that bad, Paul. Like, I, this isn't so bad that I want to just go die and be with Christ. But it's always challenged me in my, in my faith and my conviction and really in my relationship, the depth of, of love that I have for the Lord. And it, you know, even what Joe said when we were singing that song about people thinking, you know, it's going to be boring to just go and sing praise with Christ. But I think that that is a reflection of, of the depth of our relationship that we have with him. Um, and there's two things that stand out to me the most in this passage. And just the language that that he uses, it's, it's obvious the depth of love that he has for Christ. I read him, he says things like it, in verse 15, it doesn't matter. There's people that are preaching the gospel. They're out trying to get me. And then there's some that are doing it for my good. But I mean, praise God because Christ is being proclaimed, you know, no matter what. And I'm, and I'm stuck here and I, I don't know if I'm going to die or if I'm going to live and stick around. But either way, I know I'm not going to be, be ashamed because now as always, Christ is going to be exalted in my flesh. And I don't... It, like, what kind of heart change do you have to have? What kind of relationship do you have to have with a person that you can use that language and say, wow, it doesn't matter what happens to me. As long as Christ is being proclaimed, like, 
praise God, that's amazing. I'm going to keep going on with the, the direction that I'm doing. Um, and it's only the, the relationship that you can have with someone that you know. It's only you hear this language at a wedding ceremony in sickness and health, you know, better, richer, poorer. Th that is the language that Paul is using. And he's, he's living out what he writes to the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the, the, the love chapter. And he says, love is patient and kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on his own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. He's living out in the book of Philippians what he just wrote in Corinthians. That whatever is going to happen, whatever kind of evil is going to be inflicted on me, I'm willing to endure that because I love Christ so much. I know him so well, and he's worth any amount of suffering that I'm going to put up with there. And do I have that same relationship with Christ? Like, what am I willing to put up with for the sake of, for the, sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ? And he doesn't write about it as suffering. He writes about it as a blessing. If you jump down to where he's talking to, directly to the church in 29, he says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe but also suffer for his sake. It's not, it's not a sacrifice that he has to be in prison and he has to suffer for the sake of the gospel. It's a blessing that he gets to show the amount of love that he has for God by being in prison, by being slandered, by wondering if he's going to live or die or not, because for him, he, Christ is worthy, and that's somebody that he wants to show his, show his love for in that way. <clears throat> What kind of relationship produces that kind of language? It can't be a God that's just rules and procedures and law, but it has to be a God that says, I'm come to you, I've come down here, and I want to save you and bring you into a depth of relationship with me that you can trust me fully and walk with me for the rest of your life. The other thing I see is just the, the, amount, of, the amount of trust that he has in the goodness of God. As you read, there's a lot of, of uncertainty. There's a lot of whether this or that or this or that or the other thing, whether people are preaching for good or preaching for evil or whether I die or whether I live or whether I come to see you or if I'm not able to make it to see you. But in the middle of the uncertainty of not having any idea of what what is the future going to hold, there's certainty for, for the way it's going to turn out for Christ. So there's uncertainty in his situation and exactly what's going to happen. But even in the middle of being in prison and not knowing what the future holds, he's still able to say, for I know that through your prayers and help of the Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage as always, Christ is going to be honored in my body. The relationship that he has with the Lord has produced a level of trust in him that even though he has no idea what the outcome of this suffering or this imprisonment is going to be, he knows it's going to be good. He knows it's going to honor God and it's going to be glorifying to him because he's built, he's built a trusting relationship with the Lord that he can say, I don't, things are hard right now and I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's going to be good and I know it's going to be for the glory of God because things are hard. Sometimes we, we're in a time of uncertainty and we don't know what's going to happen, but we need to know that if we trust the Lord, He's good. The things He says are good, the way He looks at us is good, and He has good plans and He's going to be honored by the, by the things that are happening in our lives. We're constantly growing and called to develop this relationship that we have. It's not, a, it's not a one and done, you're saved and you're finished thing. It's a, it's a walk with me and grow with me and develop this, this loving, caring relationship with me. Um, Matthew and Luke, they both write about the, the parable of the sower, which a lot of people probably know, where the sower goes out to the field and he's scattering seed, and there's four different kinds of soil that it lands on. There's one that that lands on the path and the birds come and they, and they take it away and it doesn't grow. There's another kind that lands in the rocky soil and it shoots up really quick, but there's no depths of the roots. So as soon as the heat comes, it withers and it dies. 
The third kind, it lands amongst the weeds and the thorns, so it, it starts to grow a bit, but then it's eventually choked out by, by its surrounding. And the last kind, it actually lands on good soil, and it grows, and it produces a crop of 40, 60, 100 fold. And he tells us that the soils are people. All four of them, they all hear the word of God. It's not like there's some of them that haven't heard and had no chance to believe. All four people hear the word. The first kind, they don't understand it, and Satan, he comes and takes the word, the word of the gospel away so they can't understand and be saved. The kind that ran, lands on the rocky soil, it's people that, that have heard the word and they're really excited for a time, but there's no depth to the roots. There is no relationship, so as soon as any kind of hardship or persecution arises, the plant, the plant dies and it withers. The third kind is the kind that is too choked out by the cares of the world for the, the, the love of money, the love of things, the distractions that are, that are taking our focus away from Christ. And eventually we lose that, that relationship that we had with the Lord where he was getting our focus, our attention. And now these other things have choked out our, choked out our faith. And the last kind puts down roots, has a strong relationship and can grow and produce fruit that's that's producing for a lifetime. The Christian life is not sustainable if you don't know it as a relationship, as a God who wants to talk and meet with you, and wants you to grow, and wants you to learn from His Word, and wants you to pray and be intimately connected with Him. Because we're, we're not serving a book, we're serving a living God who's given us His Word to study from. And if we aren't if we're not serving a, purpose, a person, if we're just doing rituals and laws, then as soon as anything comes against us, then it's going to be destroyed. So cultivate that daily, weekly, you know, hourly. Cultivate that relationship to say, okay, it's, it's okay now, but as soon as things get hard, to be able to be in a position to say, you know, whatever happens, God, you're going to be glorified and you're worth it. You know, even if I'm suffering now because I'm standing up for the gospel, you're, you're worth it. Even if things are really hard, I can trust that you are going to be honored in my body now as always. Um, people, I think early on, I think we've kind of talked our way out of it for a while, but a lot of people think that it's sacrifice to be a missionary. But it's not. It's not sacrifice to be a missionary. There's some physical things that we don't have over there that we have here but it's not sacrifice at all to to serve your wife in a way that makes her feel loved it's not a sacrifice to serve god in a way because of how he's about how he's loved us it's not a sacrifice to go and say god you're worthy and you're worth it and you want me to go and you want me to do this and i love you enough that yes absolutely i'll go and do whatever you've called me to do um yeah, I, <laughs> I have never learnt, preached enough to learn how to wrap up a message, so I just kind of stop it dead when I'm done. Um, but if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I just want to pray for you guys before we close. Thank you, Lord, that you, are, that you are near, that you are personal, and that you call to, to each one of us individually, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your, prom your, your word promises that as we draw near to you, that you're, you'll draw near to us, Lord. That you're not a God who is distant and far away, but you're personal dwelling within us and calling us to a depth of relationship, Lord, that we can rely on you for everything, Lord. Grow in us the, the burning passion for your word and for prayer and these disciplines that deepen our relationship and our love that we have for you, Lord. And we just thank you that you've you loved us even when we were far and... And we just have the ability to come closer and love you more and lean on you more, Lord. I just pray a blessing over, over this congregation that just meets regularly to dive into the word and, and to, to dive into that relationship, Lord. And I just pray a blessing over the rest of this day. And we just give you all the glory for everything that happens in this place, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
The message never changes. And, and God's message to us has been consistent, right? That um, it's not about the rituals or how we, you know, I grew up this or I grew up that or my parents raised me this way or my parents raised me to believe that way. It's about your personal walk with Jesus. And I love that example of a married couple, right? Uh, taking vows till death do us part. That's the relationship Jesus wants with each and every one of us. But with him, there's one difference. That at death, it will not do you part. It'll do you eternity. Amen. So, um, isn't that wonderful? That God continues to speak to his people. Let's stand. Let's sing our closing song. Because this is a daily, a daily thing, a daily walk that we have with the Lord.
walk with Him. This is your blessing, right? Trust in the Lord and know that He is God and you are not alone. Amen. And God's people said? Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you very much. Amen.